Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I'm not complaining, I'm just saying that the mic system here is really shoddy, so the more you talk, the harder it becomes for me to hear myself even, so try to, inshallah. Um, I, I ask that in particular, usually I have very good attention span and I can talk over voices, given that I have lots of children and lots of students, uh, so I'm used to that, but this subject matter requires just an extra deal of concentration and organization of thought, so I'm requesting that you, thank you so much. Our class, keep it real. Okay, I can't stand Gatorade, okay. All right. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyid al-Anbiya'i wa al-Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. I'll try to keep my talk to about 25 minutes or so. So if it's getting to that time, just raise your hand so I know that I gotta stop, inshallah. Okay? Um, basically, I was asked to talk a little bit about atheism and theism and you know, the proof of God's existence and why should I believe in God anyway, all of which are very legitimate questions and very deep questions. None of these questions can be addressed in a one-liner. My wife has a one-liner about it. I'll share that with you first. She says, God exists whether you like it or not, and if you don't believe it, well, fine, he'll get you anyway. So, <laughs> so that, that could have been my talk. But <laughs> and I'll start, after my wife, I'll start with something that the ancient Bedouin Arab used to say. Like sometimes there would be people from other civilizations like the Persians or the Romans, they would do trade and before Islam, they would do trade sometimes or pass through Arabia and they'd see these Arabs, they still, even though they had shirk, they still believed in a God. They still be, believed in one supreme being. So somebody asked the Bedouin Arab, how do you know God exists? Kayfa amant? How did you come to faith? How did faith come to you? And you know these Arabs, they spend most of their time in the desert. So he said something really interesting. He, he pointed at his, camel, his camel's droppings, his camel's, you know, duty. He pointed at it, he goes, you know, because of that, I know my camel exists. That's all he said. That's all he said. And what did he mean by that? He meant there are, you know, when I see that in, in the desert, when you see something, it's a sign of something else. When you see a, like a, you know, a, a, a path or footprints, you know somebody walked by here. When you see a fire that's been put out, but there's burnt wood there and ashes there, you know some people were here camping and they left. There are traces here. He looks at all of creation and, as traces of God. Just like that, that small feces in front of him is trace of his camel, that his camel's there. So that in his mind, there's no doubt. That's as straightforward, as linear as his thinking is. It's as clear as day to him. That's not even a question. Now I want to come to actually the Qur'an's reasoning. Now these are very simple way of looking at things. But I want to see if the Qur'an deals with this subject. And you should know that explicitly the Qur'an does not ask the question or answer the question, does God exist? That is not a question in the Qur'an. It does not, that question doesn't exist. The Qur'an is Allah speaking Himself. Is Allah speaking Himself. And He's in conversation with His creations with you and me. He's in this direct conversation with us. The only questions he asks is, do you really believe it's me talking? Do you really believe that it's these, or these words are my own? Because you're not hearing Allah's voice, you're hearing the voice of Muhammad وسلم, and these words are being given to him. So that's the question the Qur'an asks, is this God's word or not? He asks another question related to God, are there other gods that you should be worshipping besides myself? He asks another question, he says, should you, you think you're going to worship yourself and not me? You think you're going to thank someone else other than myself? These are the kinds of questions the Qur'an asks. It never asks the question, does God exist or not? But then another question rises. Out of all of these questions, another question is born. How come the Qur'an never asks that question? How come the Qur'an never deals with the question, does God even exist or not? Why not? Why not deal with this question head on? This is one of the most fundamental problems of philosophy in human history across civilizations. So why not, if this book is for guidance for all of humanity, why not deal with this problem head on? And we find the answer to that in the Qur'an also. Why is it that that's not even a question? Why is it that that's not even a discussion as far as the Qur'an is concerned? And in order to understand that, we have to understand something about ourselves. First I'll tell you a hadith of the Prophet wasallam. He says, مَنْ عَرَفَ نَفْسَهُ عَرَفَ رَبَّهُ Whoever knew himself, really knew himself or herself, they truly know their master. If, the, if you really know who you are, then you know who your master is. 
Now, that seems a little ambiguous at first, so we have to explore that statement through the Qur'an, so we understand what it is that the Prophet is telling us, وسلم, how do you get to know Allah? The, the clue he gave is you have to get to know who first? Who do you have to get to know before you get to know Allah? You have to get, get to know yourself. If you truly know who you are, yourself, then you'll get to know who Allah is. That's a very strange thing, because all of you would probably answer, I already know myself. My name is so and so, I have a weight problem, I have weak eyesight, I have, I'm this, you know, this old, I flunked out of these many classes, I know a lot about myself. What do you mean I don't know myself? Well actually there's a part of yourself that you know. A part of yourself that you know. But there's another part of yourself that you may not really know that well. This is a part of you that Allah created before you came on this earth. There's a part of you that Allah created before you were, you came out of your mother. It was already in existence. And this part of you, the Qur'an calls it the ruh, your ruh. I'm not going to translate it as your spirit or your soul or anything else, or your personality. I won't give it any of these modern terms. We'll just call it what again? Ruh. And the reason you don't know a lot about it is because this, is, this ruh itself, most of what it is, is a mystery to us. This is something Allah Himself tells us. He says, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْرُوحِ they ask you about the ruh. Every one of us has a ruh inside us. And Allah says, they ask you about that ruh they have inside of them. Tell them that this ruh is from a special command of my master, and you have very little, you haven't been given knowledge except very, very little. You have been given knowledge, not much knowledge except very, very little of what this ruh actually is, what its function is, what its benefits are. So Allah has told us a few things. And I want to bring your attention to those few things. The purpose of me bringing attention to those things is that you and I get to know who who is, first of all. Who we ourselves are. And once we get to know who we are, by means of that we will get to know who Allah is. Who Allah is. So the, the Qur'an's argument begins with this. If you want to talk about the theistic argument, or the argument about the belief in God, it begins from this point. Now the thing about this ruh that we learn in the Qur'an, is that it was in Allah's company. That it got to meet Allah, it spoke with Allah, it had a conversation with Allah. And in this conversation, it spoke and Allah spoke. And both sides have been recorded in the Qur'an. Allah says to all of the ruh, there was a huge gathering, of all the arwah, all the ruhs, all together. And Allah asked them a simple question. Now at this point, the ruh doesn't have a question, that, do you exist or not? It doesn't have a question for God, if whether He exists or not. Well, why doesn't it have that question? It's talking to Him. How do you talk to someone and say, are you really here? Are, are you seriously, do you exist? Because I'm not sure if you're, you're there or not, you know? That would be insanity. That would be a kind of insanity that you're talking to someone and you don't believe they're there. Right? So now they're in, it's in conversation with Allah and Allah asks a very direct question. Allah didn't ask the question, do I exist? He didn't ask that question, because that's not a relevant question. He said, am I your master or not? Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your master? Do I not own you? Are you not my property? He asked that question. And all of the ruh, the ruh of the believer, the ruh of the disbeliever, the ruh of the Christian, the ruh of the Jew, the ruh of the Kafir, the ruh of the Hindu, the atheist, the agnost, the pantheist, all of them together, all of them together had one answer. And the answer was, Bala Shahidna. Of course, we bear witness. We testify. Now, we didn't just testify that he exists, because that's not what he was asking to, te to testify to. He asked us to testify to something else. And what is that something else? What was the question? Who remembers? Call it out. This, is, uh, this hall has a lot of echo, so you've got to scream at the top of your lungs when you answer. What's the question he asked? Am I your master or not? In other words, it's not just when atheists talk about God, they talk about some entity that exists that has no relationship with you. But someone who owns you has a direct relationship with you. So he talked about a relationship. Do you and I not have a relationship? And what is that relationship? That I am the master and you are the slave. That is the question he asked. That's the question that he asked us. And we all gave that answer. So now we know that he is master and we are slave. This ruh was inside of our bodies even when we were inside the body of our mothers. We were inside our mothers and Islam teaches us, the Prophet teaches us that the angel plucks a ruh, 
he takes a ruh and he delivers it inside the belly of your mother while you are still a inside the fetus. You're just a fetus and it, it blows that ruh into you. 120 days into your mother's pregnancy with you. And so now, even before you're born, you believe that you are a slave of Allah. Your ruh does. Your mind, your brain hasn't developed yet. When a child is born, their, their vision is blurry. You know, they don't have muscular motion control. They don't know what their eyes and hands are doing. Babies, yeah, sometimes you have to put mittens on them because they claw their own face. They don't know. They don't have control over those things. This part of their intellect is developing. It's going to develop over time. Eventually, they'll have enough control in their limbs and enough balance that they can walk. And slowly, they'll start making words. And slowly, they'll start using the diaper. Right? They'll develop. And eventually, they'll evolve. But this ruh, this ruh, it was always there. It was always there. And you will have to grow to a certain level before you can understand that there's this other thing inside you called the ruh. Let me, uh, let me throw this, you know, it's going to sound a little philosophical, but let me throw this at you another way, okay? If I ask you, and I've done this experiment with school kids, I don't know how well this works with you guys, but let's try. If I ask you, where are you? Which seems like a silly question. I say, where are you? You point to yourself, you say, here I am, I'm right here. And I say, no, you're pointing at your chest. Where are you? And then you say, me, right here. Oh, this is your body. Where are you? Where is you? This, this physical being of yours is going to get old and it's going to die, but you will still live. These, this, this physical body will rot. But there's, there, you is something else. What is that you? That is your ruh. That is, the, that is the actual who you are. That is what Allah put inside you. And that part of you knows Allah already. It knows Allah already. Now, what did we say is the relationship between us and the master? Oh, I already gave it away. Master and what? What are we? Slaves. And in that relationship, who's got the authority? The master does. Now, I think many of you have employers, you have bosses, many of you have teachers that have authority over you. You have the teachers that have authority over you. Your parents have authority over you in some respect, but none of them are masters. But if you talk about a parent having control over a child, or a boss having control over a child, or, or over an employee, or a, you know, or a, a teacher over a student, you can't compare that much co that control to the control of a master over a slave. A master has absolute control over the slave. A master can say anything he wants, and the slave has to do it. Like a boss can, doesn't can't tell you anything he wants. He can't. You could sue him. You know, you, he doesn't. He can't tell you. And if your job is at five o'clock, it ends. Your boss can't tell you, no, you have to stay till midnight. You say, no, no I don't. I'm from the union. You know, talk to the local chapter. <laughs> you know, you, they don't have, you don't have to listen to them at, at, after a certain point. But a master, when do you have to listen to them? All the time. Now, the, we understand that we have a master from the very beginning. And we've been disobeying that master from the very beginning. He has absolute authority over us. And we've spent the bulk of our life disregarding his authority, disregarding completely his authority. And then at the end of all that disregard, he says, listen, all you need to do is be grateful to me. Be grateful to me and ask me to forgive you for all this disregard. I'll let it all go. The Quran begins, Fatiha begins with what phrase? After Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. What does it begin with? Alhamdulillah. Now you tell me, when we think of Alhamdulillah, we think of the things Allah has given us, right? Allah has given us many things and we thank Him for it. But from the point of view of our, our, our ruh, the first and foremost things we're thanking Allah for is that Allah is our master, which He tells us in Fatiha, He reminds us again, Alhamdulillah, He what? Rabb, master, again. He's our master, we're the slave, we've been disobeying Him, but He didn't annihilate us. A farmer owns a cow and he milks the cow and it stops milking, he says, this cow is no good for me. I'm going to slaughter it, get rid of it. You do worse with your phone when it stops working. You do things to your laptop out of anger when it crashes or gives you the blue, blue screen of Malakul Maut. Right? So you have a, the things you own, don't do what you want them to do. You have, you have your way with them. But Allah has not done His way with you. He lets you eat, He lets you sleep, He gives you more. He keeps letting you go. And so for that reason, we say Alhamdulillah. And so Allah asked the question, you're going to thank someone else? After everything I've given you, and I keep giving you, you're going to thank someone else? 
Should it even be a question whether I exist or not? That's not even a question in the Quran. You understand why? Because that part of us inside, that, that part of us exists inside of ourselves. Now the philosophical argument comes from the atheist or the agnost. The argument comes, well, how do you prove a soul exists? We tried to do radioactive scanners on the sci-fi channel when a person's about to die to see if there would be any seismic activity. You seen those sci-fi shows? They try to see if the, the soul is leaving the body and then the, the thing goes and they say, ah, oh, his ghost is leaving or it's back again or whatever, right? It's just the microwaves on but that's, that's the soul to them, right? So, you know, they're trying to find some empirical proof of the existence of God. Also, the, 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 the most common form of atheism, though it has tons of different forms, the most common form of atheism you've probably come across or you've heard about from your friends and peers is the atheism that basically says modern science, modern science has reached a point in, of maturity and knowledge and we've explored the universe far and wide. There's no God, it's all science. It's all science. It's all scientifically pr plausible, provable. You don't need God to show the existence of the universe. We can all show it through laws and principles of science. There's only one fundamental problem with that argument. Science does not explain why. It only explains what. It does not explain why. It only explains what. It's the study of what happens when I let this bottle go. It's a study of what happens. It's a study of phenomena that already exist. And it's a study of the seen world. It's a study of the seen world. So it's a study of the droppings. It's a study of the remains on the campfire. And it cannot go and it cannot find the camp that already left. This creation of Allah is in the seen world. You can study it and study it and study it. But if, you, if you've lost your sense of gratitude that was inside you, Alhamdulillah where Quran began, if you've lost that inside you, you could study science till your death day and you will not find God. And interestingly enough, people who keep their ruh alive, people who keep their decency alive, even among non-Muslims, you might be surprised to find this out. And I'm hoping to convince a friend of mine who's in North Carolina, Salman Sheikh, to come over here. This is one of the last things I'll share with you. He's, a, he's got a, a couple of master's degrees, one in the philosophy of science, one in, uh, he did a, a thesis on Newton from Duke. On Newton. And that was, the question was whether Newton believed in God or not. Whether he was a muwahid. Moreover, did he believe in Tawheed or not? Did you know that Newton, father of modern physics, right? He wrote papers on the existence of God. And he wrote papers against the Trinity. And he wrote papers about why it doesn't make any sense that God would have a son. He wrote papers, like literally, it's almost like he wrote a tafsir of Surah Al-Ikhlas. That's what it feels like when you're reading it. And these are the pioneers of modern science and they're not, a, they're not, there's not one or two. There's multiples of them that actually saw science as a means of confirming God's existence, not denying it. And these are the pioneers of modern science from the Western world. I'm not talking about Muslim scientists. I'm not talking about Muslim scientists. But somehow there's this delusion, there's this gap being made, as though when you study more science, you're supposed to now believe in science instead of believing in God. It's like they're, they're one or the other. The Qur'an's argument is, exact, is the exact opposite that Abdul Rahman was making reference to. The Qur'an challenges us to study science. It wants us to study science. Because the more we study science, the more we appreciate creation. And the more you appreciate creation, if there's any good left inside you, you will be grateful. And who will you be grateful to? Not the creation, but its creator. But its creator. You know, the physician will be the most grateful to Allah because he's seen a heart beating when he does surgery. And he's seen this design. This incredible machine, he's seen it at work, up close and personal. And he says, mine's still beating inside mine, alhamdulillah. He's seen those things, he's seen them up close and personal. I, I, I know I'm, out of, I'm way beyond my time, but I'll make one quick reference and I'll close my talk. A lot of young people here, so I'll make reference to the show. Probably some of you have seen it. I've seen one or two episodes because I was curious, somebody told me about it. The TV show House. House, you can raise your hand, it's okay. I'll accept your istighfar. I'll make dua for you. Right, the, basically the idea of the show is that you have this super intelligent physician who crazy cases come to him, nobody can figure out what's wrong with the patient and he's this, this super crazy genius doctor who solves this case by the end of the episode. That's usually how the episodes work, right? But at the same time, this genius doctor happens to be what? If anybody knows about the show, as, in far, as far as his beliefs are concerned, what does he happen to be? He happens to be an atheist. 
So the idea is, well, he's so intelligent, and if believing in God was an intelligent idea, well, the first kind of person that would have believed is a person like him. Though this is not a philosophy class, at least I want you to walk away with two terms. Deductive reasoning and abductive reasoning. Deductive reasoning and abductive reasoning. You know, when, he, when a patient comes to him, he throws a bunch of diseases on the board. This could be wrong with him, this could be wrong with him, this could be wrong, this could be wrong, this could be wrong. And he's just making guesses at this point. And as soon as he throws those possibility on, possibilities on the board, he gives each one of them a shot as though it's the truth. He gives it a try. He gives it a try. And then the patient gets worse and he goes, okay, clearly it's not the first one. We gotta move to the second one. Then they try the second one, that's not working, they cross that out, they move to the third one. You see this process? They look at a possibility, they, they test that possibility, they experience that possibility, and at the end when it doesn't work, they move on. But they try it first. He never does that with believing in God. That process, that works for him when he deals with his patients. He doesn't use that process when it comes to faith. He doesn't say, okay, let me throw out the possibility that there is a God, that there is a revelation. Let me exhaust my research into this revelation, into this God. So let's see if I can actually clearly come to a, you know, proof that he doesn't exist. And by the way, another interesting thing about his philosophy is that he will not rule out a disease until it is absolutely clear that that's not the problem. Nobody believes that that's the disease. He's the only one with blind faith that says, I know that's the disease he's got. He has blind faith in a disease he can't prove. He's got a gut feeling. He's got a gut feeling. His ruh is telling him it's the disease. Right? But he doesn't do that. He uses, so that's abductive reasoning. You know, when you explore a possibility and you give it a chance, and you really exhaust your energies into, into exploring it, that's abductive reasoning. But when he says, no, logically speaking, how can there be a God? If God existed, then this would have happened, then that would have happened. And you remain in the world of if and then. You remain in the world of hypothesis. And you never physically experience anything or try anything. That is deductive reasoning. The Quran is entirely abductive reasoning. Our experience in the world, how we lead to success. We don't speak in hypothesis alone. Anybody that wants to be successful uses abductive reasoning. They follow something, they try it, they fail, they try something else. They keep moving. This is the journey of Ibrahim salam that he was trying to teach his followers. The sun, oh, actually that doesn't work out. Oh, the moon, oh, actually no, that keeps changing faces. You know what, that, that's a journey. It's a journey that's taking place. But I'm tr the, 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 the bottom line, the reason I mention all of these things to you, though I have a lot of other things to talk about when it comes to this discussion, do not think, just because people that are the atheists or agnosts or whatever, are presenting to you certain philosophical arguments that you don't have a counter argument. Oh, that's it. They've got, the, you know, they've got this mystery solved. And these billions upon billions of people that have believed in Allah and have naturally believed in Allah. Societies all over the world, all over the world, mushrik, muslim, doesn't matter. Some concept of God has always been there. And atheism is not the beginning. It's not the beginning state of a society. Some people pull out of atheism, theism into atheism. And usually it's because of some personal reason. Which inshallah hopefully will come up in the QA session. I won't spend more time on this discussion inshallah ta'ala here. Hopefully at another occasion we can take each of these things and go into more detail. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.